toilet paper. I don't understand. Like, why does everybody think they need all the toilet paper? It's not a hurricane. So just stop hoarding it, honestly. I just don't get it. Anyway. Hey friends, uh, Dr. Abdul El Sayed here. I am a physician and epidemiologist. I don't practice medicine, but I was a professor of epidemiology and then a former health commissioner for the city of Detroit. I'm also the host of Crooked Media's podcast, America Dissected. Our second season is focused entirely on coronavirus, and I'm here to answer some questions. Once you have the virus, are you immune and can you get it again? This is an interesting technical question. Um, usually when it comes to viruses, our body learns how to cope with them and how to beat them. And after that, after our first infection, then we're immune. When it comes to coronavirus, although this theoretically should be the case, we just don't know. It's a young virus. We've only, as a species, been dealing with it for about four months. And so it's still unclear, but we expect that we'll be immune after we are infected. How much more at risk are people with asthma compared to others in their age cohort? So, you know, we talk about uh, the distribution and risk of serious disease and death um, with the coronavirus as, as uh, being um, substantially higher in folks who are one of two groups. A, people over the age of 65, and then people with uh, underlying chronic diseases. Of course, the way COVID-19 works is that it causes a really serious fever and a dry pneumonia. So viral pneumonias are different than bacterial pneumonias. They don't cause the same kind of wet pneumonia, you know, the, the stuff coming out of the lungs but they cause a dry viral pneumonia. And the hard part is that asthma is a disease that's characterized by a tightening of the lungs. And so at baseline, if you, know, if you have asthma, um, the, the, the risk of this, this viral pneumonia um, being substantially worse for you goes up. But then here's the point, right? Even for those of us who don't have asthma and are young and have the privilege of being healthy, we've got to make sure that we are not spreading this disease among folks who do have these underlying chronic illnesses. Is social distancing and sheltering in place the new normal for the next 18 months until a vaccine may be available? So I wanna say a couple things on this question. Number one, I know this is really hard. I, I know because I'm doing it. And um, uh, all of us are still so uh, near to the, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago, a month ago that we started doing this and, and we know what it was like just that, that long ago. And so it's really, really hard because Everything we're thinking about is with reference to what we're missing right now. That being said, we are doing this to protect ourselves and our loved ones in the context of a really, really challenging global moment. Now, I want to speak specifically to that 18-month number because it comes out of a study from uh, Imperial College London, a group of um, infectious disease modelers that are actually some of the best in the business. They're modeling what they're calling multiple waves of social distancing. And what that's premised on is the idea that we may do really effective social distancing, which may, quote unquote, flatten the curve and reduce the burden of new onset sick people who hit our health system, helping us to protect our health system from being overwhelmed. But they argue that if we stop that social distancing, because of course, social distancing is hard, and human psychology usually moves in waves where you say, okay, we've succeeded, now we can step back a little bit. They argue that per their modeling, all we're going to see is an increase in the number of cases again. And so they argue that we're going to continue wave after wave after wave until one thing happens. And that's when enough people are immune to this virus that reducing social distancing doesn't allow for new onset spread of cases in you know near exponential ways. And so they argue that 18 months is the number because at that point, we will have had a vaccine. The first candidate vaccine went into trial, phase one trial last week. And you know it's going to be 14 months for phase one. And then after phase one, phase two and phase, th phase three can happen a little bit faster. But that's a pretty doomsday scenario. And the truth of the matter is we just don't know. My sense is that we will see a cresting in the next two weeks to two months. And after that, I hope that we will have built out the infrastructure that we needed to be able to more precisely contain uh, new onset outbreaks. All of that is to say that if we don't get it right this time, the risk of a really huge spike that would overwhelm our healthcare system, force doctors to be making decisions on the front lines between who lives and who dies, that that's really serious. And I hate to say it, but I've been looking at the trajectory of the cases and in no other country in the world, including Italy, has there been this level of new cases at this level of baseline number of cases. And just to explain what I mean by that. At no other country in the world has there been this steep of an onset of new cases after having hit this many cases in the country. 
by now, most other countries had figured out how to slow it down, which means that with all the social distancing we are doing, we're still not doing enough. And that's a scary thought because, you know, I, I hear from my friends and colleagues on the front lines all the time, whether it be in local health departments, the CDC or in the hospitals, that the, the swell of cases is starting to come and we all have a responsibility to protect them. The thing about public health is that it's public, is that like the things I do in my basement here affect you in your basement there. And we all have to remember that. So our responsibility isn't just to keeping ourselves healthy, it's to keeping everybody in our society healthy. We can only do this together. All of us have to be a part of this effort. We all play the role uh, that we can uniquely play. I've been seeing stuff online about people sewing masks to help with the shortage. Is this really a thing people can do to help? Seems like that's not really the right type of mask, but hoping I'm wrong. N95 masks are engineered specifically to protect you. All of the other types of masks are really about protecting other people. So if it's not N95, it's really more about protecting what goes outside rather than what comes inside. You know, surgical masks, for example, can protect others from you, which is the idea of a, why a surgeon wears a mask. It's not like, you know, when you're, when you're opening up somebody's body that there's a bunch of bad stuff that's gonna come out and hit you. It's more that you don't wanna be breathing the stuff that's in your mouth into that person's body, right? That's the logic there. Um, and so, you know, if folks, if it makes folks feel better to wear something that they've sewn over their mouth, fine. Um, but I just don't want people to be under any sense that this thing is actively protecting you um, just because it's not. And part of the problem also is that sometimes when those masks aren't washed, they actually take in a lot of what's in the air and it just sits there in the mask. So also not a great thing. And so my sense is that, you know, follow the instructions. If you do have masks that people should have on the front lines, get them to the front lines. My daughter's college closed down in Ohio, but she's still on campus because she has an apartment. We want her to come home to Vermont, but she thinks it's safer for her to stay there, which is best. I wouldn't fly home, but if you can you know, rent a car and come home, I think that is a good idea. I will say that one of the reasons that colleges closed, uh, closed their campuses down is because, you know, young people are active. They interact with each other. And sometimes I say this as someone who's like aging out of being a young person status, but sometimes we aren't as responsible as we ought to be, a la beach bros hanging out on beaches in Florida in the middle of a pandemic. When you get a lot of young folks on one campus interacting, that is bad news for the spread of a virus, a pandemic like this. We're out of school until April 14th. I know officials are hoping to go back to school around that time, but I'm curious, do you think that's realistic? No, I don't. Um, I think we're going to be seeing the worst uh, of this um, right around the middle of April, just if you track the epidemic curve and the experience of other countries. And so, no, I actually think that the school year is probably canceled for the year. I hate to say that, but, you know, if I'm you know putting my predictor hat on, that's the scenario we're in. And so, you know, I, I tuck into the online education modalities that we have. The fact that our schools are as unequal as they are right now is a serious issue because what it means is that for higher income folks and higher income school districts that have the means for this, um, the online education modalities are going to be fine. Um, they're not the best, obviously, but they're going to be fine. But for school districts that don't have the capacity to roll this out quickly um, and in low-income communities where the ability to, you know, uh, set this up because you have ready access to the internet and a computer, um, in those communities that don't have that, uh, this is going to be a lot more serious. And so the consequences for these kids is going to be dire. Um, you know, you're talking about, in effect, missing an entire half of the school year. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the points that we have to remember is that the long-term consequences of this are going to last well longer than, you know, the last day we're social distancing. And so the reality is, is that the people who are going to be affected the most are always the people who are the most marginalized in our societies. And so our response has to center them and we have to be focused on them. What's the risk of takeout food from a restaurant if you order slash pay ahead and they pop it in your trunk? So I want to talk about the theoretical risk and the real risk. We know that this virus is spread between people. It's folks who are shedding the virus, who have the virus, shedding it in their mucosa, the, the lining of a mouth and a nose, and uh, it can go out in air droplets. And so the biggest risk is if you come close to somebody and or the virus gets on somebody's hands and then exchanges between people that way. So there's a theoretical risk of somebody being infected who's preparing food. That being said, it is theoretical. And for the most part, I say this as a former health commissioner um, who was responsible for sanitary standards in the city, the sanitary standards that are, are maintained are meant to protect folks from these kinds of diseases and other diseases that are foodborne. So I don't want folks to feel like they can't uh, order takeout. Um, but what I will say is a couple things. Number one, um, 
you got to you gotta trust the restaurant that you're ordering from and make sure that it's a reputable institution. And two, I mean, if you're particularly worried, I would call the owners of the restaurant or call the restaurant and just say, look, what's your paid sick leave policy? Because you don't want the situation where somebody who's preparing your food is forced to go in because they're worried about whether or not they're going to lose their job if they don't. And then they're preparing your food and they're sick. And so I think this is an opportunity to hold those businesses accountable. I would then, you know, once it's prepared, you don't know who's delivering it, but usually it's covered up. So, you know, what I might do, just like I do with my groceries as well, um, is if I'm going to take it in my house, I'm going to I'm going to wipe down the the outside um, to make sure you're not wiping down the inside. You don't want Clorox in your food, but wipe down the outside with a Clorox uh, wipe um, just to disinfect it or um, just open the bag up and then, you know, wash your hands and then pull the food out of the bag and, you know, enjoy with your family. Um, I do want to say, right, one of the hard things about a pandemic like this is that we're forced between protecting people's lives uh, versus protecting their livelihoods. And and the loss of a life and the loss of a livelihood are both bad. Um, and so w- while we can, right, obviously, um, in, in we've got to listen to our public officials. And if they've instituted a stay-at-home order um, and they're shutting down non-essential businesses, then we respect that. But even as we are social distancing, flattening the curve, where we can, um, let's try and, um, and and support our, our small businesses where we can within the bounds of uh, what's safe and um, what will prevent uh, the spread of this disease. In my rural community, our response has been slower, and I assume we will not get the resources to recover as soon as cities. We haven't even recovered from 2008 and can't survive another recession. How should rural communities respond differently to the pandemic? So I'll say a couple things. From a science standpoint, you know, you're probably safer in a rural community than you are in a city simply because there's less flow of people and therefore less transmission of disease. Um, And so, you know, not to be okay with a slow response, elected officials and public officials need to respond quickly to this. And frankly, if you're in a rural community, all you have is more time, not necessarily a different outcome. But, um, you know, rural communities are safer um, in in contexts like this than uh, than cities are. But economically, you're right. Um, The consequences of mitigation, which is where we are right now, can be extremely serious and then the most serious for the most marginalized people. And it has been the case that um, folks in our rural communities have been deeply marginalized for a long time. And, um, and I worry a lot about whether or not our ability to protect people's livelihoods in the context of saving people's lives um, is going to come fast enough and be uh, deep enough. And and so my point to you uh, is to get on the phone, right? Um, call your elected officials to tell them that uh, we need effective, efficient, full scope investments in people right now. Um, and so let's not forget that like there were a series of choices that were made about how we would organize uh, access to resources in our society that made us that much more vulnerable um, to, to where we are now. And uh, and now, right, all of those things are happening at the same time, and, and that's the making of a catastrophe. And so we've got a responsibility to make sure that, um, you know, we are getting resources to folks right now, and that's a political uh, conversation that we need to be having. And, and I think, you know, the, the good folks at Podsave and, uh, and, and others have been driving that conversation, um, but also to realize that um, when all of these things happen at the same time, they can devastate whole communities, and rural communities tend to, tend to be the ones that are uh, affected the worst. I work in concert production. I lost everything 10 days ago. How long do you believe it will be before people will be okay to gather in large groups? Um, That's really hard. First, I just want to say I'm sorry. Um, You know, I had a 39 stop book tour planned and it was all gone. Uh, Lost a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the work that I do is, is, you know, lecturing at conferences and that's gone. Um, So, you know, I hear you and I'm really, really sorry about that. My sense is that, um, my sense is that we will get back there. Um, it could be a while. Um, but people like Lindsay are entirely the reason why our politicians have to drive forward on making people whole in the context of this pandemic. Because you know, we've created an economy where a lot of folks you know, work gigs and there isn't job security. There isn't you know, a pension on the back end of it. There isn't you know, health care benefits. And folks are left to make things work out of nothing. And they're the people who are the most affected by something like this. And so we've got a real responsibility to, to, to drive forward, to organize around a response. Um, there are also some really great organizations doing great work, and you know, at Crooked, we're uh, working with them to try and move um, support to the front line. So, if, if you're somebody who's lucky enough uh, to, um, to 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 have a paycheck coming through uh, through this, I hope that you'll donate some of it to Crooked.com/coronavirus. We're working with some of the most important organizations on the front lines to make sure that people are whole in the context of this pandemic. What gives you the most hope right now in this situation? 
a couple of things. Number one, uh, I get to hang out with my daughter every day and there's nothing that gives you hope like the joy and happiness of a two-year-old. And so, um, you know, I'm getting like that mainlined into my uh, psychology every day and I'm really grateful for that. The other thing that gives me hope though is that I'm part of a generation that has um, has suffered a couple of collective mass traumas. Um, the first was the Great Recession. So I graduated college in 2007 and my generation graduated right into the thick of uh, of the uh, Great Recession. And then, um, you know, just uh, 10 years later or 13 years later, we um, experienced this. And m my sense is that as we come into our own politically and socially, that we are not going to allow the continued um, insecurity of so many people in this way. Like we've, we've learned what, um, what this brand of corporatism can do and what happens when politicians hijack our society for their own best interests and the interests of the corporations who fund their, uh, fund their campaigns. And so what gives me hope is that our generation is coming into the front lines and that we will build a society that is far more robust to this. All right, friends. I uh, really appreciate the folks who joined us. Um, I hope it was useful information. Any mistakes I made, um, I'm apologizing for right now. It's a it's a fast moving story, and uh, there are mistakes that you always make when you talk about um, you know a complex fast moving story. And I hope you'll forgive me. and uh, And I hope that folks will keep tuning in uh, to America Dissected and all the crooked podcasts. We're trying our best to stay on top of this. And then um, again, for folks who want to be helpful, I hope that you'll go to crooked. Uh, dot com slash coronavirus and give. Um, these are organizations that are working on the front lines to make people whole in a hard situation. And for all the rest of us, uh, I just want to say that um, is a hard moment. It's really hard. Uh, explaining to our kids and our elders and ourselves um, what you do in a moment when you don't know what the future looks like, that's that's hard. Um, but I hope folks don't you know lose track of the beautiful things, of the meaningful things in the world, because I know for me, those have been the source of um, of happiness and joy. And, you know, that's what humanity is about, right? Like we find happiness and joy uh, in the little things, um, you know, even if it's just Anthony Fauci laughing at President Trump. So with that, uh, thank you for joining and um, and hope that we'll uh, we'll see you again soon.